then uh, we have been through this uh, the summary of of the trade uh, theory and <coughs> try to answer the questions that was raised initially these four questions why the trade how it affects production and consumption how it affects the economic well-being and uh, the distribu distribution of welfare between groups within each of the countries then lecture four <coughs> we uh, continued with an introduction to logistics and supply chain management try to understand uh, this I know that this is uh, well known to some of you but not to all of you the definition of logistics supply chain management um, where transportation is sort of connecting uh, the, the players together connected by transportation and uh, and the warehousing storage activities integration <coughs> is a is a keyword here through inf information planning and integration activities between the players in the in the supply chain um, this trend of moving away from in-house uh, production to via vertically integrated structures to outsourcing offshoring uh, production to other countries to other players and also in some cases back in house again um, there is an interesting story about the car industry in uh, in Detroit in the US who had a str very strong focus on vertical integration in-house and a very strong, uh, a small and quite strong uh, set of owners owning the car factories and a lot of people that were employed and when the car industry in the US faced competition from from the Japanese car makers based on the illustration that I showed you in, during the last sec section they had to downscale and when they faced this downscaling uh, which was quite strong the car makers had to reduce a lot of activities and because they have integrated so much into their their uh, factories steel production engines electri electric cabling seat production what have you to, to produce a car a lot of activities had to down downscale at the same time but if you hadn't had that structure if let's say they had bought purchased their or sourced seats engines and so on from independent producers then those independent producers could perhaps have also sourced or be uh, or um, delivered their products to other car makers outside of this this cluster in Detroit but they didn't because they had everything in house so everything went at the same time so Detroit city has uh, decreased their population with 1.3 millions during the last uh, I think it's uh, around 20 years because of this structure so the way you organize production is a it's a matter for the industry of course but it is also a matter for the society at large this is uh, a well-known supply chain structure where you have the focal firm in the middle and then you have <coughs> the upstream chain up to the raw material suppliers on the on the left hand side and the end customers on the right hand side and if you integrate as the car makers did integrate all this into one company you gain control <coughs> but you are exposed to risk at the same time because uh, because of this uh, this structure where let's say independent component makers could have been better off by uh, by supplying also other other uh, other factories other car factories with uh, with components The role of transportation in <laughs> in this uh, in this supply chain uh, setting is that <coughs> we have 
of different players. We have the shippers, we have the carriers, and we have the, the consignees, which are then those who, who received the cargo. Um, and there are uh, special characteristics of international transportation connected to border crossings, uh, the need for intermodal transportation and longer distances, which is also a, a matter of of uh, handling risk, different types of risk, which I'll come back to. And you had this lecture last week on on, uh, on uh, customs and uh, law and in in terms. International logistics. Uh, <coughs> we have been through this, let's say, the drivers and uh, and the implications from internationalization. This uh, focus on uh, on um, on scale effects on uh, on the factor pr costs of different uh, types of production factors. Um, of course the need to follow customers uh, to, to supply locally and fast. Um, car factories, as uh, used as an example, they, um, at least some of them, they have quite strong demands for just-in-time deliveries, which, uh, which uh, places certain demands on their suppliers with respect to localization. So if a Japanese uh, car maker decides to, to set up a plant in, in the UK, then the suppliers <coughs> need to follow. Or they need to be replaced with others. So there are, d there are different drivers which are, uh, which are listed here and which we, <coughs> we uh, talked about uh, during that, that lecture. This is uh, more or less what I already said. Um, this consolidation thing is uh, is important. That uh, one tries always in an international transport chain to consolidate cargo at strategic points to exploit the economies of scale. Um, and that can take place on different levels, and I had some examples of uh, transportation and distribution uh, stru structures in this uh, in this lecture, with the example of uh, of shipments from uh, from China to Norway. So you could you could uh, perhaps also pay attention to the various ways of setting up uh, a transport chain and the characteristics connected to that as well. Yeah. Then the comparison of national and international logistics pipelines, <coughs> where you have a lot of, of uh, challenges uh, when you go s abroad to, to, to transport cargo uh, over long distances and with, uh, with more players involved. You have this <coughs> You have this lecture on, on the rules, customs. Uh, you have cultural differences. You have the number of supply chain actors that needs to be uh, coordinated. Uh, you have this greater risk and uncertainty, which uh, which uh, places challenges to to the planning of such uh, such cross border operations. Risks, <coughs> different kinds of risks how they can be avoided was lectured um, and it's good to have a have a short or a, or an overview of this this matter of of international transport activities as well uh, where you could do mitigative actions <coughs> to be uh, to be um, let's say upfront to to avoid any event for taking place to be upfront or to have a plan B if something goes wrong. This is a contingent action. We will try to because this affects let's say the level of risk, the mitigative actions, 
the, 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 the probability that something should go wrong, whereas this one is, a, is a presumably a good plan for amending any problem that might occur. And whether you should go here or here depends, of course, of costs and benefits. So it could be good to just have a contingent action, and one typical contingent action is insurance. You pay an insurance premium, and you are uh, you are sort of you have handled the risk by paying, let, like we like we all do, travel insurance and whatever insurance we have. That is a typical contingent action. Whereas to 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 buy, um, let's say a a safe car or whatever action you can take to risk to reduce the risk probability of something uh, happening, reduce the uh, probability of a negative impact, is a mitigative action. Action. Different types of risk. <coughs> it's always uh, useful to to address let's say a specific case, and try to work out what types of risks are involved. A lot of risk types are listed here, and um, as a checklist, you can check out, is there something here that we should pay particular attention to? Um, and you have all the, the, the supply chain here, suppliers, focal firm, customers, and then the different types of risk that can be involved. And some of these risks are, uh, let's say, less relevant, but others may be, may be highly relevant, depending, for instance, on the nature of the product, the nature of the, of the supply chain in question here. Political country risk <coughs> is, for instance, a big issue if you are going to, to, to do any type of transportation through the Northern Sea Route. We have seen that in, uh, in some research that we have done, that uh, delays and the regulations uh, from the Russian side could cause severe delays. And that's why bulk transport has been the been the main activity so far, because bulk is mo normally more robust when it comes to, to delays than container, containerized cargo, for instance. This is just to show you the impacts if something goes wrong. Uh, you may have a warning, uh, then things start to... to, to uh, to have an impact on your performance, and if something really happens, you get a reduction in performance and a recovery time. Hopefully, that uh, you will be able to recover up to to the <coughs> pre-event or pre-impact uh, level again. A uh, typical example is uh, is this um, Nokia. Sony Ericsson cell phone manufacturers, where where there was a fire in a in a at a component manufacturers plant, and they had different mitigation plans to to handle that type of disruption that they couldn't get the components in. So one of them had uh, had a plan B with a with an alternative supplier, whereas the other one hadn't and. Uh, the losses have been quantified from that. Risk man management strategies was uh, was also mentioned, and there are uh, there are quite a few of them. Where typical <coughs> typical transfer is uh, is a contingent action, uh, which can be termed insurance. This is a mitigative action, also this one, and then you have a lot of lot of factors. How to mitigate supply chain disruptions? <coughs> this is directed towards production. 
they could also th uh, also let's say if think of a product strategy, supply strategy, demand strategy. Some of this is relevant for the transport chain as well. Um, we had an interview with a local transport or a local manufacturer here of uh, oil and gas equipment and about risk. And they had invested quite a lot in their suppliers. They used one transport company and they had invested quite a lot in, uh, in dedicated equipment and uh, mitigative plans, um, plans to avoid transport risks in their, in their shipments. And then we interviewed the transport company and they had also quite structured plans, plans if something happened to their, let's say, if, uh, if an engine broke down or whatever they had plans for uh, for supplying uh, or to to get on the road again as quick as quick as possible um, <coughs> it's harder for a transport company to have a a strong uh, demand strategy so there a, a transport company will in most cases be within this group to try to to have backup plans, uh, coordinating uh, or collaborating uh, trucking companies and so on that can step in if something happens. You can have uh, alternative routes uh, and alternative modes. Like for instance, if something if th something happens, you can take the most critical uh, cargo by air, for instance. You have to pay a lot, but you can do it. So <coughs> this is a summary of lecture four and six. Understand the true cost of sourcing overseas. Uh, talk about reducing logistic costs in an international supply chain. It's a lot of details that sh should be taken into consideration when understanding the cost structure. Eliminating variability out of transit times. Um, uh, that has to do with uh, uh, lot sizing um, and um, abatement plants to avoid variability. Um, tariff engineering. Um, then try to work out how you can avoid different, let's say, tariffs that can uh, affect the costs of the products, customs, duties, taxes, and so on. Um, consolidation to exploit economies of scale. Uh, try to work with others, coordinate uh, shipments so that one could achieve full container loads if possible to save money. May seem trivial, but it can be quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, of money that can be, or resources that can be saved in this way. And um, it works, I mean, it's the, the savings are entering the, let's say, the bottom line of the companies the results, the financial results, directly. It's savings, direct savings. Information, <coughs> have a good good basis for, uh, for decisions. Um, and this documentation and, and uh, information flow issues is, uh, is listed here. And then to try to avoid these uh, urgent shipments, if uh, if possible, to try to be very aligned with with the end customer needs and not oversupply quick, or to have a hi too high s level of service actually if you don't need it, and try to avoid such uh, such immediate shipments if you can.
can, uh, can do it in a more regular way without having to use, for instance, air transport or other faster modes if you don't need it. Then <coughs> we continued with uh, land-based modes of freight transport. Uh, we went through uh, road, rail, and air transport. Uh, for the land-based, of course, uh, road and, uh, and rail, basically. Um, discussed this uh, congestion issue in road transport. Showed you the, the, um, the theoretical workings of uh, congestion pricing with, uh, with an increasing demand and a capacity limit in the transportation network and the prices, that the transport prices that rises with when you enter into a situation with a capacity uh, constraint. And in this case, <coughs> with a very high demand, I mean the, the demand gives a willingness to pay that exceeds the costs of expanding capacity in the network. So then you could argue that you should expand capacity up to this level. Because then, at this point, the willingness to pay for capacity expansion equals the costs of the same expansion. So those of you who have had <coughs> a course in transport economics, this should be quite familiar. But I the logic is quite simple, and you see it, <coughs> you see it in uh, in everyday life as well. This is, let's say, the price structure of uh, of airline tickets, airline fares. This is uh, in the middle of the day, where you can have get cheap tickets. And these are, let's say, more close to the to the peaks, and these are during the peak hours in the morning and afternoon, where you can really struggle to get get low fares. So they price according to the varying demand and the set capacity. And if the demand, let's say, keeps up at this level, they can the, the airlines can expand capacity by adding another departure. And, uh, and then perhaps it can result in a situation like this uh, if they expand capacity. Rail transport went through that as well, um, where um, the structure is slightly different. Road transport is a very, let's say, it's a quite competitive market. Small units. Uh, a tendency to market concentration within road transport as well, because you have some big uh, freight companies which uh, tends to try to add on other types of services, not only transportation, and to gain market power by extending the range of services. So there is a tendency of market concentration and lock-in effects in the, in the road transport as well. But it it traditionally and still it is quite competitive. And uh, some of you are writing about cabotage and, uh, and uh, truckers coming in from low-cost countries. And the good thing about that kind of cabotage is that it keeps up the competitive pressure. It does, but uh, there are other effects which are not so good because they are competing on different grounds and so on, with different wage levels and things, but, but the good thing is that it is keeping up the competition. And that is why the EU has allowed for certain amount of uh, cabotage even within the road sector. Discuss this, uh, <coughs> this uh, simple theoretical um, connection between making a rail or sea transport system more efficient by doing some uh, s by taking some actions shifting the cost curve for ro um, sea or rail transport downwards this line here is the cost curve for road transport considered from the right towards the left, whereas the sea transport and rail transport is seen from the 
left and towards the right. And you have some equilibrium points where the costs are equal. Above these equilibrium points, the costs of sea transport and, and rail transport are higher. This, these curves look like this because of the increasing returns to scale. And when, you <coughs> when a system like that becomes more efficient, you need a bit less of cargo consolidated to make a, a scale-based system like rail or sea transport competitive. And as the, as the cargo volume increases, because it increases in this direction for, for uh, rail and sea transport, the cost advantage becomes stronger. So it can be a self-reinforcing transfer of cargo from road to rail uh, or sea within this framework. And a lot of money has been spent within the EU and also in other countries to sort of uh, make sea and rail competitive with road transport. Because the road transport cost curve increases because of congestion in parts of the road network. Not so much in Norway, it's because it's a very sparsely populated country, but you uh, see it in Europe. Uh, freight planning, a few words about, uh, about that, uh, as opposed to, to um, passenger transport planning. Is a shorthand version of that is that it's very difficult to get robust data because they are kept confidential for competitive reasons, competition reasons. Um, <coughs> so there is not um, so th so there is a quite different situation from from the passenger planning. Uh, situation. Things happen, things changes, and there are changes going on that has perhaps not a very strong connection with transport costs. It can be production costs that shifts location of, uh, of terminals, shifts location of production facilities, which affects the transport flows. But it's not the transport costs themselves that may be the main driver for this. It can be labor costs, capital costs, raw material costs, and the like. So that is why, why this, this planning is difficult. I showed you this uh, general planning procedure flow chart, more or less, uh, where the main message is that, uh, again, information, analysis. Try to analyze thoroughly the, the needs for, uh, for a given transport service, and then to evaluate alternatives, uh, calculate their costs by, by, um, by collecting data and so on, and try to find out what should be the best action in the future. This is particularly relevant when it comes to, to, to um, infrastructure planning. Let's say terminals, freight terminals, and so on where you are not able to exit in the short run. I mean, if you invest in, uh, in uh, infrastructure capital, those investments are fixed. So we need to take the right de uh, decision. If you set up a, an air freight route from somewhere to somewhere, you can leave that almost the day after. It's uh, on short notice, you can, you can uh, close that route and use your uh, aircraft somewhere else. You don't invest much in setting up uh, an operation like that. But if you invest in infrastructure, it's very important to have a very structured approach to, to, the, to the analytical side of this. Then the air cargo market. Short, uh, short um, description of that as well. The characteristics. The mixture of uh, passenger and, uh, and uh, air cargo, the belly freight um, of, uh, 
of uh, more than half of the of the volume. I <coughs> talked a bit about rates that they are as for passenger rates based on market's willingness to pay. But I also showed you an example of how you could actually use or calculate charges based on, let's say, more a cost engineering based uh, approach, which was mentioned in this uh, lecture with uh, with um, densities and uh, so on. And then last week, we uh, ended with uh, customs and income terms. And it's, uh, it's okay to have an overview of, uh, of the different steps involved. Here you have this very simple uh, procedure. You, you, you source something, you ship it, you pay for it, and then you have the next step, prepare for export, export, transport, so on. And then here, a lot of sub-procedures that needs to be uh, taken care of. And you need to decide, to decide what conditions and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Income terms group you should use. So I think this concludes the summary. Um, I can take up say This was one of the exams that I uh, I um, have placed on Fronter. Um, just a few words about uh, about them. Uh, one of you asked about question four of this 2008 exam, and I have posted a short list of elements that uh, should be included in the answers. But this problem four <coughs> is not relevant for, for this year's exam because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an exercise on, uh, on container transport, capacity constraints and things which is taken out this year. So you don't need to <coughs> pay attention to, to question four here. Um, I try to, to very of course, the questions a bit year by year, but uh, it's good to to have a look into the hints for solutions. They are not complete in terms of uh, that it in, uh, they they consist of a, a of a complete, uh, let's say, answer to the question. But they give some directions for what you should try to to touch upon when you when you answer the, the questions. So uh, here we are, uh, have asked about uh, third-party logistics provider and the role of uh, third-party logistics provider in international transportation and the economic reasons for offering and using 3PL services, which is connected to scale effects. 
Um, for some questions, I, I ask you to use examples and illustrations that you may find necessary. You are free to do that at any, uh, any, any time you find that relevant, you should do it. And you can base your reasoning upon a specific example. That can add, add quite a lot of value to your, uh, to your answers, actually. Um, this one is directed towards what I have just uh, told you about this figure of uh, the trade-off between costs within road transport as compared to sea transport, rail transport. And uh, <coughs> why it may prove to be difficult to achieve uh, has to do with the critical mass point that I uh, addressed uh, during the lecture, that you need quite a lot of cargo consolidated to make sea transport, rail transport competitive. Some places in the world that is not a problem because there is so much cargo, let's say shipped out from Hong Kong or, uh, or, or Singapore or, uh, or Rotterdam, but from Molde it's a harder task to consolidate enough goods to, to have a competitive sea transport solution. Um, problem three <coughs> is about financial crisis, which was going on at that moment in 2008. Um, but I asked for how you could cope with such a crisis. Um, that has to do with capacity planning. It has to do with handling risk um, and, it, uh, and, and the various, what type of risk factors could you then address under a situation like this? Um, what could be the consequences in terms of, of trade volumes? Um, and um, the planning of transport activities with respect to, let's say, uh, be able to fill ships, lead time consequences, and, uh, and things like that. I can take the... Uh, this one. And that was uh, the first one there is about international trade. That is what, um, what we discussed. A bit earlier on. <coughs> so this is uh, more or less as I said, uh, we, have, we have gone through this by, by dealing with this illustration on international uh, trade then. Problem two <coughs> is, uh, is uh, quite straightforward uh, to, to discuss the main differences. Um, and you find these answers more or less in the literature. It's, quite, it's, it's actually a bit too simple. I don't think I will give because this can be more or less taken directly from, from your readings. Question three goes with this uh, freight transport planning issues. You are go then going to explain to someone why freight transport is difficult to forecast and why it is different from passenger transport planning. Problem four. <coughs> Intermodal transportation. Describe bri briefly barriers to intermodality, and then you are on to this, this illustration on the cost trade-offs again. It's a variant of, of that. Barriers with uh, respect to, uh, to coordination, volumes, flexibilities, 
and uh, a discussion based on the literature that you have at hand, including the lecture notes. So I will try at the exam to cover a variety of issues. So I, d I never put all the eggs in one basket, like uh, giving you one, one big exercise or question that deals only with international trade, for instance. You will get three, four, five questions covering different topics. So you are able to, to show uh, a spectrum of, of knowledge related to this, this course. No complex uh, calculations, but uh, I'm, uh, I am more looking for understanding of the topic and the ability to use the information that, uh, that I know that you will have at hand more than, uh, more than spending time on, on, on complex calculations. So I think by that I will just uh, end this uh, session and um, wish you all the best of luck. I think you will manage quite well uh, during ex the exam and also to wish you all the best of luck with, uh, with the remaining days of work with your assignment. Yep. When will the grades uh, for the assignment? Well, there is a very short time between the grades of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the submission of the assignment and the exam. What I will do is that I will at least uh, have um, a view of who has passed and who has not passed. That will be announced on the 2nd of December because you need to pass the assignment to be able to take the exam. And uh, my plan is to also, by the second, to give you the grades. The grades will not be um, given separately on your, uh, on your certificate. It will be a composite grade of the assignment and the exam. But uh, some of you asked for, uh, for the, the grade of the assignment and you will get it. And I'll place that uh, on Frontier in the same way as I did when I commented upon the title and the abstract that you submitted earlier on. So the grade will be, and then I will use also, um, I, I use a scale between 0 and 100. 40 is passed. Above 40 is, of course. And 100 is A, and uh, I, I normally put the level of 90 points as an A. And um, the B is between, uh, I think it's between uh, 89 and down to 75. And then the C from 75 to 60. The range is a bit wider for the C. And the D from uh, 59 down to 50. And the E from 50 down, or 49 down to 40. So that's how I, uh, how I do it. So what you will get <coughs> is the, um, the grade, the number of points, and then I will add a plus or a minus to the grade uh, because I, I weigh together these things. I weigh together the exam and uh, the assignment grade and the only way to do that properly is to assign the points to each. It's hard to weigh together an A and a B without having kind of translation to, to, to a numerical value. So, um, so we will get the grade uh, and I will try my best to, to make it before the midnight on the, on the 2nd of, of December. And at least those of you who might not have passed the, the 40 points uh, threshold will be informed about that. And you will have an email about it, so that you will know if anybody ends up in that position. Hopefully, none of you will. 
I don't think anybody will. It's not. It's not normal that people fail on the on the assignment. The, it happens, but not very often. Um, I will be here uh, in office uh, up to and including the second of uh, December. If anything should be unclear during the exam, you ask the the people who are uh, who are in charge, and they will contact me. So I'll be available on phone if if anything uh, should should come up. Okay. Best of luck. <laughs>